When Olympus launched their very first DSLR camera with interchangeable lenses back in 2003, and I've got one on the table here, this was designed from a blank sheet of paper. They did not fall into the temptation of adapting one of their 35mm film cameras in order to beat the market. And in designing a camera like this from scratch, they could put in various innovations that are still useful today, and in some cases other manufacturers have not corrected. For example, if I take the lens off, and of course the problem is that dust could contaminate the sensor, not in this case. I can wave this about as much as I like and the sensor will remain clean because it is protected. I've never quite understood why other photographers sometimes will spend time on Photoshop in removing dust particles from their images. That is not the case with the Olympus E1. Why? Because it was designed from a blank sheet of paper. I've never appreciated the benefit of having a full-frame digital camera. Full-frame, of course, is a sensor similar in size and format to 35mm film. When light reaches the camera, everything is different, including the lens, provided it's designed for digital photography. And of course, in place of the film, you have a digital sensor. So why produce a camera that is based on 35mm film technology? When this first came out, there was a little consternation that the number of pixels was only 5 million, or should I say 5 megapixels. I avoid jargon, incidentally. Surely 5 million pixels is not enough for quality photography. Do you want a bet? I have achieved with this camera front cover reproduction, not just one, but two. And indeed, the Olympus magazine, when it was published, front cover, uh, not quite, it's a double page spread. No, it's not from two pictures, that is one picture. And if one was able to look at the quality of York Minster, the picture of York Minster, the quality is superb. So five million pixels from a camera designed from scratch with a digital lens, not a film lens, a digital lens on the front could produce quality work back in 2003. Many myths were perpetuated by four thirds technology, possibly from photographers who did not understand traditional photography. You know, apertures, shutter speeds and that kind of thing. There is no reason why the quality of this camera should not be as good as its competitors. Look, look, I'll show you what I mean. Let me get one of these magazines back again. As you can see, it's a portrait reproduction. Five million pixels? No, much less than that, because the original image was landscape. Therefore, you're getting about, what, two-thirds of the image of a five million pixel shot. I give you pictures as proof, not numbers and graphs. In fact, if I were to listen to everything the photo soothsayers say, I wouldn't take any pictures at all. I'd go back to bed and wear my tin hat. One of the most popular, if that is the right word, myths about micro four thirds concerns images lacking a differential focus. That is with a foreground that is sharp against an out of focus background or vice versa. 
This might be a problem for the smartphone, where everything is likely to be sharp, but not micro four-thirds. It is easily accomplished by photographers who understand depth of field and how it is controlled by lens, focal length and aperture. The arithmetic, which for some photographers is all that matters, might be a little different, but if it works, then to hell how it is done. Success in art is often achieved by doing it differently, even wrong, as judged by the expert. So beware of them. With the release of the E1, it came with its own set of digital lenses specifically designed for this camera. And of course, the system that was about to follow. I've got another one here. Now, these are designed for digital photography, not film. There is a difference. I understand that a digital sensor requires the light to pass through this lens at 90 degrees over its entire area. Now, I believe a film lens does not do that. Consequently, with this lens, you will get a sharp image over its entire area, even at wide apertures. Now, I'm afraid that even Olympus photographers weren't going to go along with this. They wanted still to use their film lenses. And so Olympus did bow to public pressure and release an adapter so that film lenses could be used on this camera. But apart from quality, if that was an issue, the other problem was that because there is a smaller sensor in there than a 35mm film frame, therefore a standard lens would act as a telephoto on that camera. So it really, it wasn't very satisfactory. In the early days of the E1, the Olympus DSLR cameras, there was a problem with the smaller sensor. And being an OM system ambassador, then Olympus, or I should say OM Digital Solutions, won't like me saying this, but to look over my shoulder and check that nobody is listening. The problem, of course, was noise. Now, my association with Olympus goes back to 1998, and therefore, over the period of many years, I got the opportunity to try many cameras as soon as they were released. And one would notice the improvements, particularly the lack of noise, gradually improved from camera to camera. And as I will show you in a moment, you see the acid test is photography, is it not, under low light. And we'll come to image stabilisation in a moment. But when I'm inside a church or say a National Trust property where I can't use a tripod, it's not necessary to bump up the ISO. That in, again will have the potential of increasing noise. So with the advancement of the technology into the current OMD series, then I can take pictures lacking noise at say 200 ISO, hand holding the camera because the recent cameras have fantastic, absolutely amazing image stabilization, which I will show you a bit later. The electronic finder, which has gradually replaced the optical finder, came in 2009. The big advantage was that now the preview in the electronic finder was coming via the camera's computer. Therefore, whatever changes you made, say to white balance or exposure, then you got a preview of it in the electronic finder. Uh, it was available a little bit beforehand on the screen of the later DSLR cameras. With the electronic finder, there was initially a problem with uh, pixelation, but that got better 
within a fairly short period. But if you were a sports or action photographer, then with the electronic finders, you got the problem of a very, very slight delay, a split second, when perhaps they were photographing uh, an athlete, where timing had to be absolutely precise. So they preferred the optical finders and not the electronic ones. Now that may have improved, but Olympus have come up with an absolutely ingenious alternative, and it's called Pro Capture. What is Pro Capture? Well, Pro Capture takes a rapid sequence of very high quality images before, during, and after the action. And then, of course, when it's all open, over, I should say, when it's all over, then you select the best image from the batch. I'm not a sports photographer, but I find the electronic finder absolutely invaluable for my landscape and architectural work, and that is in respect of exposure. When I used an optical finder on a DSLR camera, I would use either Matrix or ESP, as used by Olympus, or centre-weighted metering, but not spot, because it is very unforgiving, and of course with an optical finder you can't really see what you are doing, but you can with an electronic finder. And so with the technique of spot metering, and I have incidentally other YouTube programs that goes into this in much greater detail, but with the benefit of an electronic finder and spot metering, then I could get very precise exposure of my images, particularly if post-production afterwards was absolutely necessary, because that was in my mind at the same time. So for me, an electronic finder for my type of work is one of the best inventions in a digital camera. The superior image stabilisation in Olympus cameras and lenses almost makes the use of a tripod unnecessary. I could always hand hold my Hasselblad film shots, provided the shutter speed was no longer than 125th of a second, which a reasonably fit person should be able to do with a digital camera having a standard or wide-angle lens. At first, Photo correctness specified that the image stabilizer should be placed inside the lens, but Olympus, of course, thought differently and placed it at first in the camera, enabling the photographer to use different lenses. But they did pop it into some of their lenses later. Now, when used together, you could get away with murder. Here is a selection of images all taken handheld with long shutter speeds thought impossible a few years ago using two image stabilizers in tandem. Images that you can take with micro four thirds camera that are difficult with full frame, if not impossible. Now, my speciality outside landscapes are churches, and inside they are rather dark, requiring large apertures. So, let's play devil's advocate even inside a church and presume that tripods and monopods aren't permitted 
and there are some who enforce this rule. But you can stay away if you like. The legendary image stabilization in Olympus cameras make handheld photography possible using long shutter speeds, even a whole second. But the problem for larger format cameras, even with excellent image stabilization, doesn't end there. Because a micro four thirds sensor is roughly half the physical size of a full frame sensor, overall depth of field is increased. For example, the focal length of a 50 millimeter standard lens on a full frame or 35 millimeter film camera becomes 25 millimeters on micro four thirds and has the additional depth of field that this focal length brings. Therefore, it is possible to have sharp images with both foreground and background sharp at f3.5 or 4, helped, of course, by a wide-angle optic increasing depth of field even further. I have tried f1.8 and 1.2 with this combination, but now the foreground starts to become unsharp. Of course, you can use a smaller aperture with a full-frame camera, can't you? But hang on a moment, you are supposed to be hand-holding, and that convenient pillar for you to lean on is in the wrong place. If the vicar is not around, place the camera on the font often in the right place, which was my rescue plan with the Hasselblad. Many senior photographers, like me, progress to micro four thirds because the cameras are smaller and lighter, and they find out perhaps to their surprise that the quality is just as good. Very often the trigger point in making this decision is the acquisition of the senior rail card or the bus pass. Also, another thing to consider that in my late 70s I can still tramp for miles over mountain and moorland and quite frankly I don't want to take a plethora of gear, which I probably won't use a lot of it. You just take, want to take one camera. And very often the lighter weight and smaller size of the OMD and the pen system is absolutely ideal. And also, my pictures are accepted by publishers for magazines, books, and calendars. You know, I was once talking to a publisher, and I was prattling on about technical requirements in photographs. And I think in desperation, and uh, to be fair, she was getting a little fed up with me, because she suddenly turned round and said, Derek, I really couldn't care a damn which camera you are using. So long as it looks okay on our computer and it shows what we are looking for, we're going to use it. Incidentally, I have found out since that publishers do not like photographs with high ISO values, particularly when it's not necessary to bump it up in the 
first place. You know, art is littered with doing things incorrectly, and I certainly fall into that category. My, my other passion is music. And you know, when Igor Stravinsky heard of him, he's the composer of The Rite of Spring. And when he was composing it, and people looking over his shoulder, they were saying, oh, 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 that is naughty, you can't do that. And in fact, when it was premiered in Paris in 1913, it caused a riot. Put it on today in the Barbican Centre, for example, with the London Symphony Orchestra. Not only will you guarantee a full house today, but you'll get a standing ovation at the end. Now, I doubt if my pictures are going to cause a riot or a standing ovation. But one thing I can tell you is that I press all the right buttons, but not necessarily in the right place.